Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Berard. I'm your host, Michelle Berard, founder and CEO of Urban Book Editor and Michelle Berard LLC. And I'm really happy to share this hour with you where we examine all those places where spirit meets life and the joys and challenges that may bring. And you guys know I like to start by thanking Ms. Beverly Black and Tribe Family Channel for helping me create this space for us. Tribe Family Channel is home to an assortment of thought-provoking shows that explore life, spirit, business, and culture, including The Woman at the Well, hosted by Ms. Beverly Black herself. Somewhere in the Middle was born on Tribe Family Channel, and though we've grown onto our own platform, we are ever grateful and loyal to our roots. To paraphrase an African proverb, we are here only because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. I'd like to say thank you to my guests on the May 22nd show, author Sam Woods and his wife, Ashley Woods. You can connect with Sam online and his books are available at booksbytheshelf.org. If you miss that show, make sure you listen to the replay. You can find our complete show archives, including the May 22nd show at the somewhere in the middle podcast.com. I also want to shout out Bruce George of the genius is common movement, which encourages all of us to embrace our inner genius and share it with the world. This is a really important message, and I hope you guys will share it with the youth. But it's not just for the youth. We all need to be reminded sometimes that the world needs our genius. Learn more about the Genius is Common movement at www.geniusiscommon.com. Now, we are in a very interesting time. Right now, all over the world, People are mourning and celebrating the death and life of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others who have been killed in police violence or pseudo-police violence. There is an amazing effort, an amazing movement afoot that, frankly, I hope will not abate until we see some concrete changes in our society, not just here in the United States, but in other places as well. There's been so much going on and there's so much said, well, frankly, everybody's already said, so I am not going to spend a long time opining over the situation that we find ourselves in. I do hope that Everyone who is out there protesting is out there being safe, taking care of themselves and others. I applaud you for your efforts. And for those of us who are not out physically protesting, I hope that we are doing the things that we can to support the efforts of those who are out there protesting. This is less a protest and more a rebellion or a revolution against all of those forms of tyranny and oppression that still exist in the world. Against the militarization of our police, against injustice in all its forms. But beyond that, we should be getting at the root causes of these issues white supremacy, socioeconomic inequities, the misuse of black bodies, the appropriation of black culture, the dismissal of black intelligence, the incarceration, disproportionate incarceration of our people, all of which is rooted in a history that very few people actually take time to study and understand. I ask that going forward, we all do our best to support those who are out there on the front lines protesting and that we amplify their messages. And hopefully these shows that I'm airing help in their own small way. In my corner of the world, I choose to help in this way. 
by amplifying the messages of people who work in criminal justice reform, prison reform, people who have been incarcerated, are incarcerated, and people whose voices otherwise might not be heard. So, for this show, you guys do know that I like to take the month of June off for my birthday. And this week, we will be having a replay of my 2017 interview with Diane Sears, United States Coordinator for International Men's Day, and she's a prison reform advocate. I hope you all enjoy this interview. Tonight, I am really excited. I'm super pleased to introduce my guest. Her name is Diane Sears, and she's just amazing. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about her. Diane A. Sears is the United States Coordinator for the International Men's Day, a position she's held since 2009, and the inaugurator of the International Day of Prayer for Men and Boys, which is observed in November and launches the United States Observance of International Men's Day. In October 1999, Sears launched In Search of Fatherhood, a quarterly international fatherhood and men's issues journal, which moderates a global dialogue on fatherhood. The concept for In Search of Fatherhood was created by Sears' mentor, the late L.T. Henry, a classically trained jazz musician who briefly performed with the Philadelphia Orchestra and was a former drummer for internationally acclaimed songstress and film and television actress, Miss Della Reese. L.T. Henry also was an author, a photojournalist, and a sales and success motivational trainer. Mr. Henry envisioned a world in which men from all walks of life would work together, support one another, and share solutions to address the unique issues directly and indirectly related to parenting from a male perspective. Ms. Sears has spent the last 18 years resurrecting Mr. Henry's vision and perpetuating his legacy. So I'd like to welcome Ms. Diane A. Sears, who's somewhere in the middle with Michelle Barrett. Thank you, Diane, for coming on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. I want to thank you for extending the invitation. I also want to extend a thank you to Ms. Beverly Black for bringing the two of us together. Yes, that is amazing um, that we are able to connect. And I think it's really fascinating the work that you do because I have always said, you know, men bring something different to parenting. You know, there's a different energy. Just the way they interact with kids is different, and the lessons they teach and the way they teach them is different. So I think the work that you do is really fascinating. Now, Thank you. you may already I, have uh, heard <laughs> – Go ahead. I'm sorry. You no, know, um, my mentor, L.T. Henry, um, he totally transformed my life. Um, he, everyone who was lucky enough to, to be in his orbit, he totally, positively transformed their lives. Um, and uh, he did that for me. Um, he just totally changed the way I, I look at every everything. Um, so... I couldn't let that die with him. Um, we were supposed That's to work awesome. on it together, as a matter of fact. And I was supposed to be in the background, which was fine with me. And he was going to be out front, um, you know, doing all the talking. And, and uh, you know, had he lived, you would be talking to him and not me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it didn't happen that way. And uh, so so here I am. Um and I have to tell you, this has been a fascinating journey for me the last 18 years. Um, it's totally changed the way I look at things. Um, it, it has totally expanded my horizons, uh, and it's given me some keen insights on what, uh, what's going wrong in uh, not just in our community but in society as well. But it has also put me in touch with great people, uh, such as yourself, such as Beverly Black, and other people uh, in the United States and around the world who are working on all these problems. Um, and, and these are folks that you don't necessarily see or don't necessarily hear about. 
So even though it looks like our world is operating from an upside-down position, there are people in the background on the sidelines that are, that are working. They've got some, some great initiatives, some great tools uh, that they're using to try and, 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 and turn things around, to try and recreate the village, uh, to, and to try to bring healing and empowerment uh, to our community. And our family. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let me ask you then, since um, you kind of started down this road, and I typically like to start interviews with two questions. And the reason I like to start with those two questions is because I think they lead right into what you're doing and why. So here are my two questions. Diane A. Sears, who are you? And how did you become who you are today? Who am I? Well, I, I'm a native of Philadelphia. Um, I have a background in law. That is my that has been my day job as a paralegal. Uh, but but writing has been my passion. Um, and um, who I, who I am today? Um, I'm. I'm someone who's learning. I'm, I'm learning things. I'm a learner. I, I'm learning things. I would like to think that I'm using my talents as a writer to bring healing. What my purpose is uh, twofold: um, to continue to resurrect my mental vision and to perpetuate his legacy. Same time, um, to show people uh, that there is hope. Uh, that you have options. That is that is a part of the the many lessons that I learned from uh, my mentor. Those those were some of the lessons that he taught me. So I hope I've answered that question ac- accurately enough. Oh, that's wonderful, actually. And so that, of course, leads me to ask a few other questions, like. For example, you say that you are someone who is always learning, and that's actually my motto, always be learning. So what kinds of things do you feel like you've been learning through this process of working on In Search of Fatherhood? Well, well, I'll tell you, interesting, when I launched In Search of Fatherhood, it led me straight to prison, and I'll explain that. When I launched in search of fatherhood, the first group of of fathers to totally embrace uh, the concept for in search of fatherhood were incarcerated fathers. My mailbox was flooded with letters from incarcerated fathers from Maine to Hawaii saying, "Hi, I heard I heard you got this um, uh, this publication." Well. Here's a poem I wrote about my daughter, or here's a poem I wrote about what's going on in the world, or, or here's an essay I wrote on fatherhood uh, and, and what it's like trying to raise children, even though I'm behind bars. And so I would publish the article, I would send them a, uh, a free copy, and then they would write me back and say, thank you. But then the letter would go on and say, I'm 35 years old, and I've been in jail since I'm 19, or I'm 26 years old. I've been in jail since I was 16. So when I, I got two or, when I got two or three of those letters, I said to myself, hmm, now that's interesting. But then I was getting letters from, no exaggeration, from Maine to Hawaii, and they were all telling me the same thing. So... I'm dumbfounded. And I'm saying myself, well, how can it be that we have 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds who just disappear from the community and there's just no yelling and marching and screaming and, and demanding for justice and bring my son home, bring my husband home? You know, I'm, because to me, it seems that the community should be out in the streets and mass marching, and you know, because this is America. There are countries where people disappear uh, and they're sent to prison, and, and, that's the, and that's the norm. So 
um, the universe put people in my life and put me in, in the path of people who had answers. Um, and um, so I learned that it has a lot to do with the educational system. It's not a level, it's not a level playing field for boys, period, uh, in the educational system. But for African American, African American boys, it's worse. Uh, there is the parenting issue, um, fatherlessness, uh, coming up in uh, uh, single parent homes. Uh, you have situations where mothers don't have any training in, in how to be parents, and particularly how to deal with raising boys. So you have some situations where uh, the mother is frustrated and she takes her frustration out on the child, uh, on the boy. So he grows up um, confused because, first of all, mothers are mothers are the first female role model for boys. Mm -hmm. And so he's looking at mother as someone that's supposed to protect him. But if he's getting a lot of uh, physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual abuse uh, from his from his mother. Uh, that makes it very difficult for him to relate to women as he progresses in life. When he starts dating, if he gets married, um, he's going to have a problem. The other thing is um, he has all this pent up anger and frustration from the way that he's treated at home. So when he's in school, um, he's going to resist authority. So there are going to be some behavioral problems. And so we get back to the education aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, our boys are 50% um, more time uh, characterized as unteachable and as behavioral problems. Um, the teachers don't take time to say, well, maybe little Johnny is coming from a fatherless home, and that's why um, he's misbehaving and that sort of thing. Or uh, they don't say, maybe there's some underlying reasons why uh, Johnny's in fourth grade, but he has a first grade reading level, and maybe I can work with Johnny to help that. They don't do that. Our boys are bright. So if he has an IQ of 200 and he's in the fourth grade but he can't read beyond the first grade level, he's automatically characterized as dumb and unintelligent. So they shift him off to special ed, um, mm -hmm. which puts him on the path where he doesn't like school and so he leaves school. So he drops out of school, has no education, has no diploma, has no skills, and so we know where that road leads, at least to prison. Uh, gotcha. gotcha. So, yeah. So, I just had one. I I just had one goal, and my goal was, to, you know, to resurrect my mentor's legacy and to uh, uh, resurrect his vision and to perpetuate his legacy. And I just said, wherever the road takes me, that's where I'm going to go, and and that's where the road took me. Uh, and at, and this is where the learning curve comes in for me, for me, because I really, it really gave me some insight about what's really going on, and it, it taught me a lot about um, looking at underlying causes, why things are the way they are. Um, now, I don't condone um, some of the behavior of um, of uh, our children, but I understand why they behave in the manner that they do. I get it. And and so this, this put me in a position where when I meet a young man, particularly a young man, I'm not judgmental. You know, if I see him with the hoodie mm -hmm. and the, you know, and the saggy pants and all that, I'm I'm not judgmental. Uh, and I don't shy away from them. Most people, when they see them, or if they're walking down the street and they see a young man 
with a hoodie and the saggy pants, they will shy away from them. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm I'm not naive, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, what I do, I will acknowledge their presence, uh, and I'll just say, "Oh, good afternoon, young man, or good evening, young man," and you should see the look on their faces. Um, it's like I gave them a million dollars. Because, because you're being acknowledged, they're present. Well, when I see them, they're angry. They've got a scowl on their mm -hmm. face. They don't look friendly. Mm -hmm. And so, so is it, that's, and, that's my that's my question. Is it because are they are they surprised that you acknowledge that they existed? Basically, is it that they felt otherwise invisible, and when you acknowledge them, exactly, kind of, because and mm. because it's the way because it's the way that I do it. Uh, I do it very respectfully, um, and it's my voice reflection. I don't come across as I'm the adult and you're the child because that's not going to work with them. Mm -hmm. I, I treat them as an equal, adult to adult, and and I and I would just I'll look at them and I'll say, oh, "Good afternoon, young man," or uh, "or good morning," and they're just shocked. One of the reasons they're shocked because they hear a lot of yelling and screaming. Uh, there's a lot of yelling and screaming going on in the house and elsewhere. And so when somebody talks to them in a calm voice and they can feel my energy, it just it just shocks them. I had a situation once where um, I was uh, visiting my parents. And um, I was walking down the street, and there were about three young men um, in the middle of the block. And I had to get past them uh, to get into my parents' home. And so I looked at the situation, and so they turned around and saw me coming up the street. And, and they had this, they had a, oh, who is this, who is this coming up the block kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. And so I walked, so I kept walking, but I didn't invade their space. But when I got close enough where they could hear me, I looked at them, expressed no fear, looked them, looked at them, and said, good afternoon, gentlemen. And their head snapped around. First of all, no one had ever called them gentlemen. <laughs> But but see, but I had a double I had a double edge. There was there was a double meaning in that. I, number mm -hmm. one, I was being respectful. I'm I'm saying you are gentlemen. The other the other meaning was that um, if you're not one, act like one. Gotcha. <laughs> so and, and so, so after they got over the shock, they were like, Oh hi, how are you? Uh, have a nice day and. I went on I went on my way and went into my parents' house and that was the end of that. Very cool. But you so that's what I what I've learned is you have to meet we have to meet our children and our young folks where they are. You know, we might not like the we may not like the music, we may not understand the music, we may not understand the dress and all that other stuff. But what I have discovered is that when you uh, when you acknowledge their humanity, because they ask the proverbial question that every soul on earth asks, and that question is, do you see me? Do you hear me? Do I matter? Mm -hmm. And that's what our young folks are asking uh, when they when they do the flash mob thing, when they act up. When they're disrespectful and on and on and on, that's they want to, That's what they're really saying. Do you hear me? Do you see me? Do I matter? What do I have to do to get your attention? Now, that's not the way that we were brought up, <laughs> you know. But it is what it is. So that is one of the things. That is one of the many things that I learned. 
the other lessons that I other life lessons I learned is that wisdom comes from all places. Um, and there are a lot of um, incarcerated men um, in different correctional institutions who have put together some phenomenal initiatives uh, that address fatherlessness, just that address violence, um, that address crime and recidivism. Um, we uh, that's where our creative talent is. That's where our brain power is behind behind the wall. Hmm. So let me ask you some questions then about what you what you said because you said so many really important things here, and some of them resonated with me because I am divorced and I do have a son, and I remember when I realized that there was an issue with our relationship, and I couldn't figure out what it was because I had um, two daughters that are older mm -hmm. than him, and I could talk to my daughters and just say, okay, go do this, 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 and this, right? Go clean your room, mm -hmm. go take the garbage out. Yeah, I could give them, let's say, a list of things to do. And they would take that list and they would organize it in their brains and they would do it. And I noticed that my son did not like that at all. It took me a while to figure out what it was about what I was saying to him that was driving him nuts. Because I could see his eyes glaze over <laughs> when we were talking. <laughs> And, like, there's something about my communication style that he's having trouble with. That's what, what came to me about all of this. And I had to change the way I communicated with him because I can't talk to him in the same way that I talk to the girls. I, For example, if I want to give him a, a, a few chores to do, I have to say, okay, go do this and then do this and then do this. And I think it's because the way my brain works, I've already got this process, right? I've already kind of kind of thought through what I need done and how it should be done, and I trust him to pick up on that. But because I started thinking maybe guys think differently because I didn't grow up with brothers. I have no idea. Maybe that's why I wasn't good at marriage, right? Maybe they have a problem. Well, no, way that actually, they, they actually you're right. Actually, you're right. They do. But it, it's even deeper than that. Uh, one of the things that my I learned from my mentor was um, how people how people listen uh, and how to talk to people. But that was how. So that helped me in the corporate world. Um, some people are visual, and some people are auditory. By that I mean, there's some people. Uh, if you want to get them to understand what you're doing. If they're visual, you have to draw them a picture. You could talk to them until you're blue in the face, but they're not going to get it. They have to see it. On the other hand, people who are auditory, uh, you can just talk to them. They don't want to see any writing, no papers, or anything. Uh, so, you, so you have a situation like that. Um, and so that has a that has a, a lot to do with uh, that has a lot to do with it too. But if you're a parent, you're not going to be trying to figure out, well, gee, is my son visual or is he auditory? You know what I mean? You're well, just, I mean, you, one of the things you learn is you, yeah, you just want the stuff done. Most parents, especially if you're a single mother. Um, you're working, you come home, you've got to cook, you got to clean, um, you got to help with the homework, um, you're, you're, you know, you're probably up at the crack of dawn, you probably don't get any rest, you probably don't get to bed until midnight by the time you finish dealing with all the stuff you have to deal with. And then you have to wind down from your day, too. Right. So I'm just, one of the things, I'm just bringing this up things, because it's, it's nobody's fault. Well, no, you not it's I'm anybody's saying. fault, but, but, but one of the things that I learned as a parent was that each of my kids had different personalities, and I had to uh -huh. learn how to work with those different personalities. And that was 
I, I didn't really realize until, you know, it was a few years ago where I said, okay, he's not, he's not responding well to what I'm saying, and I'm talking to him just like I talked to Marina or to Kayla. So if Michael's having an issue, what is that, what is that about? And I, cause I could literally see the shutters go down. And I said, maybe it's something about the way that I'm communicating. And so the reason I ask those questions is because, um, what I'm hearing, one of the things that I heard you say was that moms oftentimes don't know how to parent. Well, I don't, nobody knows how to parent when they become a parent typically, but moms, single moms, uh, don't have that male influence. And then they also don't know how to parent boys. And so what is unique about the parenting or communicating with boys that that could be helpful to um, a mom to know? Well, I, boys, well, first of all, let's start, at the, let's start at the beginning about boys. I'll give you an example about boys, the difference between boys and girls. Okay. You have, for instance, you have you have a little boy and you have a little girl. You, you, girls, let's say you take them out somewhere. Uh, let's say you take them to, uh, let's say um, you have to go see your lawyer. As a, as a paralegal, I've seen this a lot. And, and I've, at some point I've, I've intervened uh, and very gently. And so the mother will bring in um uh, little Susie and little Johnny. And so little Susie, uh, children don't understand that mommy is in a meeting, that sort of thing. So Susie may get a little fretful. And so mommy will say will say something to Susie, will tell Susie, Susie, here, read a book. And Susie calms down. So you have a little Johnny. Little Johnny gets stressful. And so the mother will tell him to read a book or the mother has to tell him five or six times to calm down. See, boys are different. Boys have that boy energy. That's what we don't understand. So to get a boy to calm down, you have to give him a toy or a task uh, that's going to capture his imagination and occupy his mind because boys, they like to pull things apart. Like Shroud Horror, right? <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I can't believe how many stories were just ripped apart. They're staring at him in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm laughing because I remember, I remember walking into Michael's room. He was about, you know, three years old, four years old, and he had these little robot toys. We, you know, we got them for Christmas and stuff, and he had taken them apart trying to figure out how they work. And they had pulled all the exactly. wires out of <laughs> Exactly. But that's what they do. And that's why they get in trouble at school. Because it's that boy energy. We don't understand that. And that's, that's one of the things that was brought to my attention as I was doing this work. And there's this there's this boy energy where they're they're poking and pushing and pulling and how does this work? And they're taking stuff out and, and they're preoccupied. So you can't, so the way that you get Susan's attention is different from the way you get little Johnny's attention. You want to get little Johnny's attention? I don't get him a, a, a puzzle or something to, to something that will occupy his, his brain, something that will fascinate him. So he, so it will fascinate him to such a degree um, that you don't have to worry about him for 30 minutes. Now, what I would do when um, the the little boys would get stressful and that sort of thing, and I would say hello to the mother uh, and that sort of thing, I would get um, a, a, a legal pad and a pen, and 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 kind of, and I would get their attention and go hi, and. Um, I would get them to draw or write or something, and that would occupy them and, and calm them down. Mm -hmm. But, but see, but it's because of that, that work that I had been doing, those questions that I had been asking, and all those people that the universe put in my path, 
when I asked that question, what's going on? And they were telling me, well, this is what's going on, and that's what's going on, and, and et cetera, and et cetera. But see, we, we live in such a world that um, parents can't figure it out. Maybe, maybe, and maybe the reason why we, we have some of the problems that we have is because we're not a village anymore. I was, I was one of those children that was raised by the village. Uh, I've often said that the group of children who were born between 1950 in the 1950s to the 1970s were probably the last group of souls who were raised by the village. Uh, and so by that I mean you had mom and you had dad. Um, if you didn't have dad, there was mom, there was grandmom. If you're lucky enough to have a granddad, he was around. And then you had aunts and uncle, uncle, and they supplemented uh, your your training and, and your 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 um, development uh, because they might notice some things that mom didn't notice. Oh, there were things that they could add uh, to the picture um, that mom might not be able to add to the picture, you know, because she's busy. Um, she's doing the best she can. But see, we don't have the, we don't have that anymore for the most part. Well, let me ask you this then. So I'm curious about this from the school perspective as well, because I also recall, um, and and I draw my own experiences, so I hope you don't mind that. But I recall no. when um, Michael went to kindergarten, and I really wanted him to be in pre-K for an extra year. But in Georgia, um, they have their age cut off, you know, and so even though I put in the application for the program and I said I wanted him to be in pre-K, they put him in kindergarten mm -hmm. and didn't mm -hmm. really notify me. They just said he's in kindergarten. So then a few, I'm going to say about a month into school, the teachers wanted to have a meeting with me and they said, well, we want to send him to this special class because he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. And I said, I know he doesn't do those things. The reason he doesn't do those things is because I work from home and he did not have to go to pre-K. He didn't have to go to, to early childhood. So he didn't learn how to sit at a desk at three years old in early childhood. He got to go with me and we would explore. We would go to Whole Foods and smell the different coffee beans and we would go to the park mm -hmm. and pick up leaves, we didn't do those things. And that's why I wanted him in pre-K. And you mm -hmm. all decided that you knew more than I did about my kid, and you decided to put him in kindergarten. So, no, you can't put him in a special class. You get to teach him those things now. Because I asked you to do it the right way, and you didn't want to listen to me because you decided you knew more. And I perceive sometimes that that's the attitude of the schools is that they know so much more than the parents. And when the parent says, I want this for my kid, they want to say all the reasons why that's not the right thing. But parents do know their kids, I think, a lot. And what can we do as parents to work with the teachers and the administrators to kind of get over those communication gaps where they feel like they know everything, but you're like, no, but I know my kid and I know what he needs. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, you, I have to say that's audacity on their part. Um, yeah. See, when we were coming up, they listened to the parents, and mm -hmm. the parents and the teachers worked together. Now, one one way to, to 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 cut that off at the pass uh, is that to have a before the child uh, enters uh, school to sit down and have a meeting with the principal uh, of the school uh, and uh, some of the teachers that they uh, uh, that are going to interact with the child and 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 just you know explain to them. Um, you know, my child is a little quirky, um, 
and my child learns best in this environment or my child uh, has a problem when they're in, in, in this type of environment. My, and my child is not the kind of child that will, uh, that can sit for three minutes, sit down for uh, three hours and not move uh, and explain to them why um, and say, okay, is there, uh, is there something that you can do about that? Uh, can you just make an exception in his case and allow him a break? And if it can be done in such a way without disturbing the rest of the class, I, you have to you have to kind of negotiate. But here mm-hmm. again, parents are up against the wall. But you really it, the way the educational system is now, you you really have to negotiate for it. And I mean, I had a situation when I was in high school where. Um, um, I chose. What did I, I think I chose. Um, I chose when I went in high school in my uh, first year. I chose a certain curriculum, and then I changed it. And so the counselor called me into the office and uh, told me, uh, "Wanted me to sign some papers." Uh, uh, and if I had signed those papers, I would have gotten a general diploma and not the diploma representing um, the curriculum that I changed to. I changed to curriculum academic, and the reason why I did that right. was I wasn't sure if I was going to go to college. So just in case, I had commercial, I had accounting skills, I had a, a stenographical skills and typing skills, just in case mm-hmm. I decided I didn't want to go to college. I had a way of making a living for myself. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, I was raised, um, my father didn't raise me. Um, Not that it matters. I was raised by my mom and uh, my uncle, my uh, mother's eldest brother. And um, so I went home and I told them what was going on at school. And so my uncle said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. and so he went to the school um, and and talked to them. And so they gave him the old right around about, um, well, the reason why we went, to, the reason why we told her that is because we, um, uh, it, because she's changing. She she makes too many changes about her curriculum. Well, I was in a curriculum. Well, I didn't know I was young. I had, I mean, I didn't know. And so I, so Two weeks, I'm in there for two or three weeks, and I'm like, oh, I don't like this. So I said, well, let me see what else is, let, me, let me see what else you guys got on the menu here. I mean, that's the And the the general the, the golden rule in the house was, if you if you pick the curriculum, of course you own it, and we don't care what it is, but you have to bring in good grades. That was right. and that was the golden rule. So basically, they said, look, you're in high school now. We took you as far as we can. You have to learn how to make decisions on your own. And they said, now, if you take a course, a curriculum, and you decide that's what you want, then, then you have to excel. You, we're not accepting failures here. And so, well, they, and they also told me never, ever sign anything. Never, ever. We don't care what they tell you. That's not your job. You, your job is to go to school to learn, not to sign documents. Yes. If, if they give yes. you a piece of paper, you bring it home to us, and we'll make the decision. So they were like, well, Mr. Sears, um, love of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, see, the atrocity, part of this thing was racial, too. Um, it wasn't. And I wondered about school. that when you said it. Yeah. See, this school was out of. It was out of, I grew up in a, a predominantly African-American community. This school was outside of the community. Uh, but um, it was a good school, and the, and my counselors in my junior high, because of my grades, said, this is the best school for her. And they were right. Um, mm-hmm. And Because back then, you didn't go out of your district. The only way you went out of right. your district is there was intervention. And so... The counselor intervened and said she needs to be there and not in the school in the district. 
Um, so the bottom, because I was switching stuff around and I was, and I was a, a student of color and the, the person who was making the decision that I, that I was going to get a general diploma was, was Caucasian, all of that. Mm-hmm. So, so my uncle, he talked to me and he asked him, he said, well, what's the big deal? And so they gave him a bunch of excuses. So he said, okay. So he said, what's her grade point average? Well, she excelled. So he said, is she late? No. Is she a behavior problem? No. So he said, well, what's the problem? Well, he said, she is blah, 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 blah. And so he said, well, he said, as long as she's getting good grades, as long as she's not a behavior problem, she's never late. She's all, she's always, um, she's always come to school. If she says she wants a course, give it to her. So then he said to them, so then he said, oh, by the way, is she in school today? Now, he knew I was in school, but he was playing dumb. So he said, is she in school today? He said, yeah. <laughs> so they said, yeah. So, so then he said, call out of class. He said, because they were giving him a run around about this, that, and the other. So basically, mm-hmm. he was bringing he, to bring me into it to confront them. Right. So they told him. So they told him, "Oh, Mr. Sims, we can't do that." So he said, "Well, why not?" He says, "I'm here." He said, "I'm her. I, you have me listed as her guardian. Why can't you? Uh, why don't you want to call her out of class? She's in class, and she's oh yes, yeah, she's in class. She's reporting." They said, "What's the problem?" Oh, Mr. Sims, we can't. We can't call her out of class. Oh, my word. So he said, will you call out of class or anything else? He said, here, I'm coming in here getting you people straight about 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 her diploma and, and, and what's going to what's gonna be and what's not going to be. You don't want to call her out of class. Well, that was the end of that. I had no more problems. I imagine not. I imagine not. Hey, I've got a couple of people on the line who want to talk to you, uh, Diane. Do you mind if I um, I go ahead and open the line for a couple of callers? Sure. I think great. So I've got area code 408. Your line is open. Well, good afternoon, good evening, and God bless. I am honored to uh, listen to such a profound show somewhere in the middle with Michelle Berard, and I want to say hello to your guest, Diane. I wanted to just chime in. I'm going to go nameless, but I wanted to just chime in um, to offer a little bridge between the gap in the conversation that I'm hearing because I raised four kids, two separate sets of kids. And um, when it comes to dealing with the school systems, um, Mm -hmm. let's take it back to the genesis. The genesis for black and brown folk were, it was against the law to acquire an education. True. Okay, so when you take it back to the genesis and you bring it forward, you are on the front line of protecting your child's right to an education based mm-hmm. upon how the two mesh together. You're the liaison in between as the parent. Now, the school has to understand and recognize, and this is how I raised all four of my children as uh, with regards to the school system. One My child's education is my responsibility. So when I drop off one of America's finest to your school, I expect that we are all on the same page. That means that my child's education is the priority in this equation. And then with that understanding, I make sure that I engage um, a communique, bring door policy with the principal, with the school counselor that is assigned to my child, children, and with their teachers. I go to back to school night, um, and it is also understood with my employers, okay, that my children are being raised. I will not be here during the hours of back to school night because I will be at 
back to school night. Okay. So Mm -hmm. everyone gets on the right page with you raising your child. Now your child has to be on the right page. Child cannot be little Johnny that does no wrong. But at the same time, the child has to know that the parent has that child's back and by, by in no uncertain terms, is there any room for, um, I would say, any room for compromise? There you go. Thank you. There's no room for compromise. So my child is dropped off that dropped off at the school with the understanding that they have shown up ready to learn, ready to sit down, be instructed, and learn and be taught. Okay. Said school understands that. Now, suppose my child doesn't learn the way everyone else learns. Suppose my child is advanced or put ahead intentionally to be guided into the lane that says this child is not not comprehending at this level. Okay, well, I know my child better than anyone. So if I say my child needs to be in the lower K or the upper K and you put them in the upper K, guess what? You just put my child um, into the upper K. So now my child is the little fish in the big pond. Okay. Mm -hmm. Set up for failure. Okay. So I'm going to bring some grandmother wisdom. My children's grandmother told me, do not let them advance my child. Let my child stay the big fish in the little pond. Oh, my God, what you tell me that for? Oh, baby, what did she tell me that for? Okay, now this child is now 22 years old, but she remained the big fish in the little pond all of her academia. So much so that by the time we get to high, and I'm hands on, okay, when you see me coming or you hear me calling, it's about my child. Don't take it personal, okay? And if and if <laughs> I mean it's just that way. I've taken my child out of high school, sat down with the dean. <laughs> you know, I have a literacy program. I cannot allow my child to stay here and fail because of how you teach. Okay, I'd be happy to come back and help you, but I'm pulling my child out. Okay, now there are mm-hmm. online courses that are free that your that any anyone's child can stay home and be homeschooled, okay? We do not have to put up with the public school system, okay? Understand that, and I know I'm going on, but I'm I'm cocked and loaded right now. So <laughs> understand, understand that the federal government receives a certain amount of money for your child to sit in that seat. Well, guess what? Between the school and the federal government, you got to be teaching my child at a level in which I approve of, and that means that you are meeting their first teacher standards. So you understand that you are their second teacher. Now, when my child would be home from school, guess what? How was your day? Did your teacher behave? Did you learn anything new, exciting, or special? Because see, I know darn well you behaved, okay? I know darn well you behaved because I sent you there to learn. Did your teacher behave? Did you learn anything new, exciting, or special? If my children said no to any of those questions, we have a problem, Houston. So you have to, the bottom line to summarize is the parent is in control, always. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't always that way. So that's why this is the bridging of the gap between Diane's experience and uh, dissertation, because we were at their mercy. Oh, please let my child come and learn and sit at the, you know, advanced desk. Well, when you have advanced children, they'll sit your child at a desk with the least advanced children so that they will hope to bring the the least advanced children up to speed, but they're holding your child down. You got to watch the school system. So mm-hmm. when they place your child in a big fish, in a big pond, as a little fish, Michelle, that's intentional. 
okay? You know how your child learns. You have to let them know whether your child is an audio, vis, vis, visual, or what type of learner. We have children that learn from touch. They're better mm-hmm. hands on. You know, my son, I can relate so much to you, and then I'm going to let you go. I'm, I can relate so much to you, Michelle, with your son, because my uh, third child, he is the type of learner where he's he has that that mind that can put things together and has to figure things out, has to touch it, feel it. If you if you tell yeah. him, you know, to do this and this and that on paper and all this and that, you know, let the child just learn at his rate and his speed and and at his um passion. Okay, if he doesn't like this, that, and the other, guess what? Don't force it on him. You have to observe your child, and this is for parents worldwide. Observe your child. Your child will show you who they are. When you see who they are, you encourage that. That's your job. Not to change them and make them vicariously play sports and be a lawyer and this and that. And then lastly, if they argue with you, sue them to law school. Let them know, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> okay, you got that much litigation in you, then you go to law school, baby, because you, you argue, you good. <laughs> now, I'm going to return your show to you, but it's a battlefield. <laughs> yeah, this is interesting, because I can relate to some of that, because I was pushed. Um, the mm-hmm. teachers would always say, you know, I think you need to be here. And mm-hmm. so I, they would say, okay, I think you, I, w- I might be at A, and the teacher would say, okay, you need, to, we think you need to be at B. And so they would call in mm-hmm. my, my mother and my uncle. And, um, and so I was pushed. And so what, well, what most, well, I could come from a different situation. There were between 45 and 50 students in a class, okay? That was the norm. That was the norm. That was the And that's one. another thing. Yeah, that's another problem is that student teacher ratio and you know that that's even more of a reason for the vigilance from a parent's perspective. Um there it's just it's such a different age. But well, you know that my mother my mother tells me but here's what I was told at home about that. What I was told at home about that was, okay, there was, my mother used to tell me, there was 45 to 50 children in the classroom. And she used to tell me the teacher doesn't have time to, to go to each individual child uh, and, 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 and resolve their issues or, or make sure that they know this or that or the other. And so then she used to tell me, she said, who do you think the teacher is going to devote her time to? Is she going to devote her time to the child that doesn't want to learn or the child that that learns? And so, so I got pushed at home. And what they used to do, they had friends who were teachers. So um, the year, like if I was going in, if I was in first grade and I was going in the second grade, by the end of first grade, they automatically knew um, the new stuff that I would have to learn in second grade. So that summer, I learned all the second grade stuff. And this went on until I got, uh, when I got to junior high, halfway on my own, but they kind of like monitored me. And, but then when I got to high school, you know, they said, okay, this is it. You know, you're on your own. But I used wow. to get prepped. I was getting prepped, and mm-hmm. if anything was, if anything was going on that was weird at the school, um, they would go in and negotiate. That. So, so I guess the, the bottom line is what I'm hearing here is, as parents, we have to we have to negotiate. Unfortunately. We're in a position now where we have to negotiate with the teachers, with the school board, with the But see, Diane, Diane, I'm sorry, but that's where I differ. There is no negotiation. That's why I say I bridge the gap between, I think, where you make, where you're making your point 
and where mm -hmm. um, Michelle's question arose because we've already been negotiated. They get a check every day that our child is sitting in that seat. So we right. have to realize who has the power. You cannot negotiate with my child. My child will not be your check in that seat if I am not seeing where things are going appropriately for my child's education. My child won't even be in that seat. See, that's where yeah, I'm I, I, that's I agree with you. I agree with you. You know, there's just no more room more for negotiation. I think it's more of an yeah. advocacy role, less of a negotiation, because I think parents don't recognize the power that they have. Um, and if and that's parents nothing recognize to say. the power that they have, then they can go in and advocate a little more strongly for their children. And I've had to do that on more than one occasion. In fact, I have one principal who didn't want to see me comment. Because I'm like, no, 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 you're not going to do just anything with my kid. And I, because I know that you need my child here. She contributes too much to the school. She brings mm -hmm. too much in terms of leadership, academics, and everything, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. get a check. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want us here, let yeah. me know. Because I will get up and go. Because we, I can put her in another school. But I think there's more to And you can keep her at home. Thing. And well, you can keep her at home. Wanna, and see, that's the power. Oh, on, but I'm going to step I off wanna, the show and let you ladies continue. May I? <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank, I thank you for chatting. I enjoyed the call. <laughs> thank you. Have, have a blessed day. Caller who might, I have another caller who might want to pipe in. So I want to make sure that we get great, um, great. area code 209. If, if area code 209, I don't, uh, let me unmute your line. Area code 209, area code 209, did you have a question or a comment for Diane Sears? Hello. Hello, can you hear Hi. me? Hi. Hi. Yes, we can. How are you? Uh, my name is Geraldine Hollis, and uh, oh, I have followed the conversation. You? I'm good. Yes. So I followed your conversation, and as you were talking and speaking, I was relating to the in the middle uh, because I definitely have traveled that road, uh, elementary school, high school, college, and then as a teacher, and from mm. a teacher to a specialist, so, uh -huh. um, and then on to an author. So uh, basically, I have seen a lot of this uh, go through, and I'm just uh, trying to um, think, okay, this is something that needs to be known, and it definitely needs to be um, implemented. Uh, we need to know that our education is one of is the most or uh, most important thing that we have as people, especially as African American people. And uh, if you're a woman, you definitely need to make sure that you are keeping up with the education. Now, my thrust has been since education, and probably all through school was. Uh, promoting and knowing about the library and mm. because I was able to have supplementary things going on for me. And I, I, I grew up in the uh, segregated South. Mm -hmm. So I had segregation and degradation. I'm speaking, we're talking about learning and teaching and all of these things, but the school books that I had when I got them in the high school, they had names filled in with all of the white students from the white school. So we didn't have that opportunity. But for me, going to the library, that helped me to learn how to do things. Uh, I love the idea of how you brought it out from the uh, the beginning of school, of uh, how you laid it out about uh, your child, um, knowing how your child would react and act in a certain uh, environment or learning situation. And one of the things that I have going for me is that after all of my teaching experiences, I went back and became a specialist. That way I went in and talked with teachers and I worked with students that had special needs. My main thing was to look at students because they would label them. They would label them. And my thrust was inclusion. Don't keep this child over here just because you think that it has a problem, but bring it in and infuse it with all of the education. And so this is what I did to make sure that students got a 
the the one hundred percent opportunity to be at their very best. Mm-hmm. Now I don't have any questions. I just have some comments because there's just so much that uh, needs to be discussed on this, and I think what you're doing to bring this out is so relevant. And I cannot do anything but say continue to work on this. Right now, uh, we don't grade teachers. But I tell you what, students grade teachers. And Mm -hmm. I'll explain why I said that. Because if a child is doing good in school, they're going to appreciate that teacher. Mm -hmm. If they're not doing well, then that means that somebody needs to look in and see why. Now, for me, I've been retired for 20 years from just teaching. I'm on a social media, and over half of my over a 1,000 stu- uh, uh, friends are my students. And the only thing that I can say that they can say about me is that I did a good job. That didn't mean that I was easy. It meant that I stayed on them, that I was concerned about them, that I made sure that they knew what they needed to learn. And so that 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 for me is that uh, evaluation of the fact that uh, people need to make sure that the children are learning because in the end, it's going to reflect on the person that is given the information, whether or not they're learning. Okay, just one other thing. My granddaughter is now a teacher. Mm. What she's finding out is that there is not a lot of teaching going on. But Mm -hmm. by the same token, I'm looking at what you're saying about parents. Parents are the first teachers. They're the first teachers. They really need to see what their children are doing or to be advocates for their children, if this is not being done, then you're just letting your children go through the washer and they'll come out with with whatever has been thrown at them. But I I really just want to really express that very thoroughly. Parents are the first teachers. And I like what Miss Beverly Black said, because we don't have to, at, at this point in life, you don't have to let somebody mess your children around. You can do what you need to do for your children. I know quite a few people that are uh, school uh, homeschooling the children, and you have all of this access and abilities to go in and utilize the district's books, facilities, and everything else, and you can give your child a very good education if you have that time and knowledge to do it. So I just say, Continue to work with the children to get them to learn as much as you can. And that is a job that we need to do, not just on the surface, but we need to do it from the bottom up because that's where our young people are falling behind. They're just not learning. And I I work with history, historical things. And I often say, if you don't know your history, you're destined to repeat some of the same bad things. Definitely. Thank you and so much, Mrs. Uh, Collins, for your comments and your wise counsel. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to listen to you and to be able to speak. Hopefully I said something that might resonate, that might make a difference, but at any rate, I'm well, just uh, delighted that. to think about. Now, I is my mind that. still open? Yes. Okay, this is Beverly. I don't want to um, take the mic, Diane, but I just would like to um, let everyone know that uh, Geraldine Hollis is actually one of the Tougaloo Nine that uh, helped desegregate the library system in 1961. And um, I am going to mute myself, but... I just wanted you women to know that history is on the line. All right? So I am enjoying the show. So God bless. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'm going to mute myself out. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Hollis. Thank you so much for getting on the uh, call with us. 
I think that a lot of really important information has been shared tonight, and a lot of think about have come up. And I know that there are folks way smarter than me who are working on some of these issues. Diane, you mentioned that there are a lot of people working on uh, initiatives around the world, not just here in the United States, dealing with education and and and. Uh, for your part, you were talking about incarceration and how those are related. So what we're going to wrap up now because we are a little over an hour, and I like to be respectful of people's time. But what would you say is a key initiative that folks might be interested in, in knowing about dealing with education in particular? Oh, in education, uh, there is the uh, National Million Father March. Uh, which uh, is out of Chicago. Uh, it's uh, headed up by Philip uh, Jackson of the Black Star Project. Um, what that it started in 2003 in Philadelphia, where I uh, live and work. We've been participating for that in ten, for for the past 10 years. The, what the National Million Father Mark does is puts fathers into the uh, education equation. Fathers are encouraged on the first day of school to escort the child to school. Not only that, to meet the principal, to meet the teachers, to get a copy of the child's roster, to get a copy of the the a calendar for the academic year, and to be proactive all throughout the uh, academic year in their child's uh, uh, schooling and learning. Because uh, we're finding out that when uh, dad starts getting involved, uh, children take uh, the educational process more seriously. Uh, so, so that that is a national program. It's in about I think it's in about 600 cities now. Uh, so and it's, let me it's, ask you, it's very effective. The fathers are going into the schools. They're reading to the children. They've become mentors. Uh, here in Philadelphia, uh, they call it uh, they call it Father's Day in September. Our school year starts in September, and the fathers um, uh, part take the children to school. We've had situations where the mayors have gotten involved and they march with the fathers to school. The news media comes out and covers it. Uh, this year, the emphasis was on raising the literacy level and reading level of all boys in all schools throughout the city of Philadelphia, uh, because we're finding out that boys are lagging behind girls when it comes to reading and writing, uh, and that's key to their success in school. It's also a key to keep them out of the school-to-prison pipeline. So, so that's Very one cool. initiative. Yeah, that that is one initiative. Um, another initiative is the um, when this comes out of um, SBI Greaterford, uh, there's a group of of uh, individuals uh, f from the Latino prison population and from the African American prison population uh, at SBI Greaterford, which is the largest male maximum security prison in Pennsylvania. Uh, they came up with a, uh, a fathering program called Fathers and Children Together Initiative, implemented on the inside of the prison. And on the outside of the prison, they have an external team. I just, I'm happy to be a member of the external team who helps to co-implement it on the outside. Um, the reason for this being, um, they looked at the situation and they uh, and they d decided that getting fathers to bond with their children and incarcerated fathers to bond with their children and to be more proactive in the lives of their children would reduce intergenerational incarceration, recidivism, violence, and fatherlessness. It's a 14-week program. The way it works is uh, for seven weeks, of, uh, first of all, fathers are picked, incarcerated fathers are, are selected. They go through a vetting process. 
they have seven weeks of intensive uh, psychological and, and parenting training, and they're taught how to bond with the children. Um, and they, uh, they're they taught to look at what their absence uh, from the household, from the child's life, what's, what's that doing to the child, how that's impacting the child, the family, and the community. Okay. Uh, at the same time, the mothers of these children, they go through an orientation and a training session, too. The next seven weeks, the mothers and the children go to the prison, but the mothers drop the children off at the prison. The children go to the meeting room and meet with their fathers. Um, it's, it's alternating on Thursdays and Fridays, every other Thursday and Friday for seven weeks, where they bond with their fathers. They participate in arts and crafts. Uh, they participate in workshops. There is a, an, a, a session uh, where uh, each father is asked to go to the center of the group. We sit in a circle. Each father is asked to go to the center of the circle, bring his, his child, and um, talk to the child. We had a situation where a father uh, had his, his teenage daughter uh, in front of the group, and he said to her, I wasn't there when you were born. I wasn't there when you took your first step. I wasn't there on your first day of school. Um, I wasn't there for your birthday. You're getting ready to graduate from high school. And unfortunately, I won't be there. But I promise you, um, from this position, I will always be a part of your life. And, I mean, this is the sort of thing that goes on. Um, mm-hmm. The children who go through this program, when they enter the program, some of them are behavior problems. Some of them are D and F students. Some of them have been suspended. Some of them are about to get kicked out of school. As, as a result of going through this program, the great shootout. We have several children who are now honorable students. All that nonsense about and didn't have to stay in the principal's office and getting suspended. Uh uh-uh, uh, no more. It's totally wow. uh, changed the attitudes of the children. But more importantly, the parents, the mother and the father, learn how to co parent. In many situations, the mother has moved on to a new relationship. But, um, or the father gets out of the program, uh, he gets out of, uh, out of prison. And he has he has a, his own life, but they come together and they work for the benefit and the good of the child, and they work as a team. They check their egos at the door. All that personal stuff is out the window, and they're like, "Hey, you know, you know, let's let's get together, let's parent, let's be there for our child," and and that's what they do. And as a result of this. Uh, the mothers who participate in the program, uh, they, they befriend one another. The children who have participated in the program, they befriend one another. The fathers who participate in, in the program become friends. So it, it creates a family, and in the process, is recreating the village. Very cool. Very cool. Well, and actually, that's really interesting to me because I – um, as an editor, I, you know, editing urban books, I have clients who are incarcerated who reach out to me, mm-hmm. and one of them uh, reached out to me just today and said he was feeling, he didn't say he was feeling sad, but that's what I got from it, that he was feeling a little sad. This is a tough time of the year for him being away from mm-hmm. the kids during the holidays. Mm-hmm. And I just, I felt so bad because there wasn't much that I I felt like I could do to help reassure him that the involvement, because he does try to stay in touch with his kids and tries to talk to them on a regular basis and has them working on little projects and things like that. So I think he's a re- he's such a dedicated father. And I wanted to reassure him in some way, but I didn't have a lot to um, reassure him with, in my opinion, except to say I think your kids know that 
you would do anything for them. So what it sounds like is coming out of programs like that is the the children get to hear from the fathers themselves that exactly um that that they care that they um they love them they care and they will do what they can to, given their circumstances. Exactly, that is part of what the um, the the uh, the intensive psychological training and the intensive parenting is about because some of these men didn't have fathers in their lives, um, so they don't know how to bond. One of the exercises that they do is um, the children learn what their father's favorite color is, what his favorite um, football team is, what is his favorite sport, and conversely, the fathers learn, uh, and this is required, that the fathers learn what their child's favorite color is, what their favorite uh, TV program is, what their favorite sports is, that sort of thing. Um, mm. and, and so, and so they, they create a, a bond. For all those things that they miss learning through observation. Yeah. Hmm. Very cool. Very cool. It, it, so it is, um, it's amazing. It is fascinating. Um, you should, uh, I, uh, the external team members, uh, we chaperone the children uh, into the meeting room. And uh, I, uh, along with another external team member, uh, one night we chaperone the children and uh, uh you go through a set of doors, and then there's a ramp, and then uh, there's a large window in the, in the meeting room, and the fathers were lined up with their faces and noses pressed against the window of the meeting room, waiting to, waiting to look to see if their child was in the crowd coming through the, coming down the ramp, and when they, when the men saw the children coming, their faces lit up with smiles, their eyes sparkled, and as the children made their way down the ramp toward the door that opened into the meeting room, the fathers clapped for them. The children walked into that meeting room to the sound of applause. Oh, that's so, wonderful. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that goes on. That is really wonderful. Now, the mothers, the mothers, uh, they're treated to dinner. They go to the Olive Garden for dinner, which the incarcerated men pay for. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So while the, so while the children are bonding with their fathers, the mothers have an opportunity to relax, um, uh, they have an opportunity if they're having issues to talk about them. If they need resources and support services, that's the time for them to speak up and say what they need. And then uh, they also uh, go through a counseling session at the dinner. And when it's over, when it's over, the mothers come back and they pick up the children. It's just phenomenal. Um, you cannot get through this program and not be transformed. Oh, definitely. You, every, I can't see how you can. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just amazing. And you can see the transformation in the faces of the children, the mothers, and the fathers. It, it's, um, it's phenomenal. And this program was put together by incarcerated men, a number of whom are lifers. Who will never get out of prison. Wow. But they're brilliant. These guys have uh, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees. Some of them have PhDs, which they earned while they were in prison. And they're walking around in prison with a PhD. That's amazing. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, and some people do complain. I've heard people complain about um, incarcerated people getting these college degrees and, and advanced degrees while they're inside. But my question would be, what would you have them do? I mean, would you, I, 
it it seems like it's it's the perfect opportunity to spend time in reflection and learning. Exactly. Then they can come out and contribute to society. You know, for those who are going to come out, you would want them to come out better, right? Exactly. Yeah, because of this program uh, that was designed by incarcerated men, the men who go to this fatherhood program who do come out, they come out, they hit the ground running. Uh, they have a new vision. Uh, they they come they hit the ground running. They're parenting. Uh, it starts it. As a matter of fact, what we do when we know that a gentleman is coming out of uh, when we know the date on which the father is coming out of of, of uh, prison, uh, we arrange a surprise meeting uh, for the for the father and the child. Uh, we had one situation where the father showed up. Uh, he had just gotten released. He he got released, let's say, 8.30 on a Monday morning, and the state rep arranged with the uh, the school board and the principal for the uh, formerly incarcerated father to surprise his children. And so what in this particular situation, the um the the son and the, the son was called to the principal's office and he thought he was in trouble. And the principal <laughs> took him down to, took him down to the library and 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 his father was waiting for him. And so the principal said, Do you know this man? He goes, Yeah, this is my father and he was so surprised. <laughs> and so then That's wonderful. The, yeah, and then the daughter they surprised the daughter. Oh, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. That's wonderful. <laughs> absolutely wonderful. Well, Diane, you have been absolutely a delight, and you have shared so much wonderful information with us and, and, and wonderful anecdotes about what's uh, going on in some of the programs. Tell me, how can people get in touch with you? Where can they find out more about what you're doing? Okay, well, they can reach me by email at um, insertyourfatherhood at gmail.com. That's uh, insertyourfatherhood at gmail.com. Uh, or they can Google me uh, at insertyourfatherhood. Okay. All they have to do is put yeah. insertyourfatherhood in, uh, in the Google search engine. And I would be okay. happy to... Uh, uh, no, I got kicked off of Facebook. <laughs> they kicked me off of Facebook last year, believe it or not. <laughs> okay, okay. I w that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know. Maybe I'm doing something right. <laughs> Maybe you are. That's what I'm thinking. Um, so folks can Google in search of fatherhood and they will find you and they can exactly. email you at okay, in search of fatherhood at gmail dot com. Was that correct? Exactly. Awesome. Awesome. And I think you're forgetting to remind them that they can hear you on the air also. Oh, forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, every second Saturday. Um, we're having a show coming up on that Saturday, December 9th at uh, um, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That would be 12 p.m. West Coast Time. And uh, I think that would be um, 2 p.m. Mountain Time and 1 p.m. Central Time. And the name of the show is In Search of Fatherhood. Okay. And you are also... Um you're also co-producing a show about incarceration, Incarcerated Lives Matter 2. Yes, I'm very fortunate to, uh, to have that opportunity. And that one airs, what, the fourth, every fourth Saturday at, at 12 exactly. Pacific, is that correct? Exactly. Uh, 12 Pacific, awesome. uh, 3 o'clock uh, uh, Eastern Standard Time, and the... Uh, the next show is going to be on the 23rd. 
December 23rd at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 uh, p.m. West Coast Time with Dr. Maxine Ryan. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Well, Diane, thank you so much for joining me on Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Berard. I appreciate you taking the time and also all the wonderful things you shared with us tonight. We had a lively, lively discussion. Yes, we did. <laughs> and I was, you know, I, I, I love feel it. so comfortable with you. You are a great oh, thank host. You. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I've really enjoyed it. You know, I felt like we're, I felt like I'm in your living room and we're having tea. <laughs> Well, and that's exactly how I want it to be. You sit around. Well, I'm from New Orleans, so I wouldn't serve you tea. I'd probably make you a cocktail, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be having a couple of glasses of wine and doing our thing, but this is how this is how we do it. And I really want you guys to all feel like you can reach out, communicate, share with us. I really want everyone to um, feel welcome. We want diverse opinions. We want lively discussion, and that's the way we learn, right? Lively, respectful discussion. Thank you again. Thank you to your audience for listening in. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, Mrs. Hollis for calling in and sharing her wisdom, and I enjoyed the chat with uh, uh, Beverly Black as well. And, again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the great work that you're doing on the air here and your work in publishing. And I wish you thank continued you so success much. and the very best. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's our show this week, guys. You can reach out to me online at urbanbookeditor.com or michelleberard.com. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram as Urban Book Editor. Send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send in some topics you'd like us to cover on the show. Now, since we do take the month of June off to celebrate my birthday, and I would like to give a shout out to all the June babies out there. On June 26, we will also be having an encore presentation. This one will be of the interview I had with criminal justice reform advocate, Dr. Maxine Bryant. You can find us twice a month on Fridays at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, and 8 p.m. Eastern at the Somewhere in the Middle Podcast.com. Let's continue the conversation. You guys be good, stay mindful, and remain prayerful. And be safe, y'all. Peace and blessings. <laughs>